Gold Shields brings true stories from law enforcement, the military, true crime authors, and first responders. Experience the dedication, danger, and emotional toll with the heroes themselves. These gripping tales of true crimes, true stories, and true heroes are all here on Gold Shields. Hey, welcome back to Gold Shields. This is Dan Murphy along with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. We're thrilled to be with you today with a guest that we're blown away that we have. Uh, just an amazing individual. Can't wait for you to talk to him. But first, as always, want to give a couple of shout outs to some people who we want to thank. Um, first is Impact Solutions. Impact Solutions is the new alternative to pepper spray. It's a revolutionary way to do policing or personal defense. Cops don't use pepper spray. Tom and I in our 50 years, Tom, how many times you use it? Goose egg, right? Never, because it's a pain. You got to deal with it afterwards. So we came up with something we think is the answer for it. Give cops a tool in their belt they can use that's viable. Give people a tool they can use in any environment. You don't have to worry about where you are, like with pepper spray. You can use it in an elevator. You use it in a car. Somebody in a cab is getting stupid with you. Bang, hit them in the face with it. Impact does what you want without doing what you don't want. It doesn't give you respiratory distress. It doesn't cross-contaminate. It's not airborne, water-based, and it cleans up amazingly quickly. Learn more about it. It's for sale, and it's rolling. We're rolling pallets through lately. It's incredible because it's so different and better. Carryimpact.com to order yours. Carryimpact.com. If you're from a law enforcement agency, we're happy to talk with you about getting some samples so you can do some testing. We realize it's a new type of product, but it's amazing what it will do for you. It'll keep your officers safe. They won't have to second guess and think if they can use it. And with that in mind, I want to move on to my partner in crime, Tom, who's going to tell us about my favorite drink. Uh, the official coffee of uh, Gold Shields. Uh, and there was a coffee. lot of competition for that. There was a global competition, I'm telling you. <laughs> At least <laughs> one company for vying for it. And Bonefrog won. Uh, Timmy Crutchshank and his team do an unbelievable job with putting an amazing product out there uh, for everyone. And the best part about it is their mission. Uh, money and the proceeds go to uh, U.S. Navy uh, families, Na Navy SEAL families. And uh, it's an unbelievable organization, company, and we're proud to be with them and getting sponsored by them. And, uh, you know, Danny drinks it all the time. Unbelievable. Loves it. And uh, bonefrogcoffee.com slash gold shields. Promo code gold shields. Anything you want on there, get a discount using our gold shields promo code. And uh, can I wish I drank coffee. I drank it all yeah. the time. <laughs> you know, in, in addition to being a great cause and a great, great guy, great human being who runs it, came up with it, it happens to be the most flavorful coffee I've ever tasted. And I'm a former cop. Tried them all. This stuff is awesome. I'm not just saying that. Awesome. Uh, lastly, before we get to our, to our guest, who we're thrilled to have today, uh, Tom and I are affiliated with the National Law Enforcement Officers Hall of Fame, which is having its annual induction ceremony on March 22nd down in Fort Worth, Texas. So very notable and deserving people will be inducted in this year. The National Law Enforcement Officers Hall of Fame was founded by Megan Stockberger and Adam Davenport as a means of memorializing and commemorizing, commemorating the exceptional work done by the men and women of law enforcement over the course of a career. And everybody else has a Hall of Fame. Why not the men and women who protect us 24-7 around the clock for little money, risking their lives, and who manage to not just do that, but do exceptional things during the course of their career? And that's what the hall exists for. So National Law Enforcement Officers Hall of Fame, look them up online, learn more about them. If you're in law enforcement and you know somebody noteworthy, somebody whose career should be memorialized in such a way, let them know, nominate someone. And if you're anywhere near Fort Worth in March, make your way over to the ceremony. You'll be happy you did. You'll see some real heroes. They're always looking for sponsors as well. So if you have an organization or a desire to help this, this effort to grow this on, to a national level where it's really reaching where it should, um, do yourself a favor. Make an investment in the Hall, a National Law Enforcement Officers Hall of Fame. Thrilled to be a part of them. 
But now, without further ado, we're keeping him waiting in the green room, the virtual green room, way too long. Our special guest today, Tom, who do we have? You know, we're very lucky and, and uh, thrilled to have this, this man here, a uh, 26-year veteran of the ATF, legendary career, not just in ATF, but in the undercover operations that he ran. Uh, unbelievable. I read, uh, looked at his show, which we'll get into, and what he does. I mean, listen, undercover work is dangerous. Now you're going to hear what goes into it. Lou Velozzi. Welcome to Gold Shields, and thank you, my friend, for being here, pal. Hey, um, thank you, guys. And this, I, I'd just like to start out by saying that, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the NYPD, uh, and you know, you guys having having the long careers you had. I, I mean, you know, with with police departments like NYPD and LAPD, who I was lucky enough to work with a lot. You know, you guys never have a break. It, I, it's action all the time, every day, and if you can have a long career like both of you guys had and, and, you know, and make it out alive and, and intact. I mean, it really is saying something. So, you know, I'm, I'm big fans of your guys and, and, uh, just want to thank you guys for having incredible careers and, and doing what you did to keep the city safe. Very kind of you, Lou. Thank you so much. And right back at you, you know, we're, uh, we're blessed. Tom and I know that we, we made it through a real tough time in New York city. Uh, us and a lot of other really good people. We got very lucky and blessed to be surrounded by great people. And um, it's an honor to have you on because, man, talk about jumping into the fire. Undercover work is dangerous on any level. But some of the stuff I've heard about that you've done, wow. I mean, you know, you got nerves of steel, my friend. So let's dive into a little bit about you, Lou. Where did you grow up? Where are you from? Uh, and what led you to this this line of work? I grew up in Albany, Albany, New York. And, uh, I, I was I never had any any kind of law enforcement uh, ambition at all. I, I was kind of uh, I, I didn't really have any direction. Um, I kind of fumbled my way uh, into college uh, on a, on a football scholarship and, and barely made it out, but but I made it out and uh, again with no direction. And you know I, I took a job working at a bank, making like eight bucks an hour, sitting in a room. With no windows, um, putting like computer printouts in, in files, and just I mean I, I was miserable. I was 21 years old, and uh, a guy I played football with, um, he was down in the Bronx with his brother, and he said, "Man, you, you sound miserable. Come on down, just come hang out." So I drove down uh, one afternoon, and we're sitting on the stoop, and I didn't even I never met his brother, didn't know his brother and this guy pulls up and he's driving a Corvette. Right. And, uh, this is in, in the Bronx, he's driving a Corvette and he gets out and he's got the long hair kind of, you know, this is Miami vice days. Right. You know, and it's kind of feathered back and you know, he's got his shirt open and he's got a 92 F a Beretta in his, in his waistband. And I'm looking at this guy saying, wow, this, this guy's, this is a pretty cool looking dude, man. And, uh, it turns out he was a DEA agent and he had, just gotten back. He'd been working undercover in South America. So we sat at the table and, um, you know, he shared a couple beers with me and we talked and, you know, I started asking questions about what he does. And that was it for me, man. The, the, you know, the sky opened up and, and the lights went off and I was like, man, I can do this. I want to be an undercover agent. Um, but as you guys know, you don't just, you know, you don't just become an undercover agent, you know, you pay your dues. Uh, so what I did was I started taking all the tests for all the alphabet agencies. And uh, the only advantage I had was, you know, most of the guys who are taking the tests for these agencies are guys who are cops, you know, who've, you know, they've been away from the school thing for, for years. Um, but being, at least I was fresh out of school. So I, I was able to score. I, I just must have had a good day because I'm, I'm, I'm not smart. I'm not a good test taker, but I, I got a really high score on what was called the treasury enforcement exam at the time. And, uh, I got the call, uh, because of my score and they asked me for, to come out for a job interview in Los Angeles. And, uh, I didn't even own a suit. My mom took me down to the garment district in New York to buy a suit. And, uh, you know, I flew out there with, I tucked all my hair in, in, inside my collar and, uh, went through the interview with no low expectations, right? Cause I was totally unqualified. 
Uh, but I think sometimes when you have low expectations, you're not nervous, you know? And, and, and next thing I knew a week later, I got a call and they said, Hey, pending, uh, you know, a, a background interview, we're going to offer you a job in LA. And that, I kind of fell into it. Um, and then, you know, I, I, uh, it took me about eight years once I got on the job. You know, I, I worked the streets of LA in the early nineties when it, it really was one of the greatest places in the world to be a cop. You know, the gang problem was just, I mean, it was blowing up all these Central American gangs coming in who were, they, and they were beating the shit out of the American gangs, right? They, you know, they were introducing a level of violence that had never been seen before. Uh, they were chopping heads off. They were out of control. So I learned how to be a cop by being on a LAPD task force. And that's where I learned how to work the street and how to be a real cop with those guys. And uh, there, there really wasn't a lot of opportunity for me uh, at that point, you know, to work undercover. And I, I wasn't ready yet anyway. Uh, so after, you know, I moved bouncing around a little bit, about eight years, uh, I, I actually landed in Georgia and just again, by, by pure luck, uh, my first partner, he was kind of my training officer. First, first part, even though I, I'd already been on for eight years, I had switched agencies. Uh, he was, he was an undercover guy. He was a, a kind of a legend in, in the Southeast working undercover, real crazy dude. One of those guys who, who just, uh, you know, took, he took everything overboard. You know what I mean? When, when he, if he, if he had to do something to get over, he would go totally like out of bounds and get over like anti-management, one of those guys. So I loved him and he taught me the ropes and I started working undercover the way you should nickel and dime street buys. You know, I was buying dime bags, right. And I was buying, you know, little stolen Raven 25 pistol and, uh, yeah, I knew I, I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do those long term infiltrations. You know, there were guys like Jay Dobbins who you had on the show. Uh, you know, guys like Chris Bayless who kind of ended up mentoring me, who were doing these these long term infiltrations on the bikers, on the mafia, on the cartels. You know, but before you can jump into that, you gotta learn how to be an undercover agent. You gotta you gotta pay your dues uh and do the street stuff, which is to me, like as I look back on my career, the street stuff is probably the most rewarding uh, and the most dangerous, uh, you know, part of undercover work. And, and so, you know, I, I actually kind of got into it very organically, you know, the way you should by paying your dues and putting years and years in, you know, getting a reputation. Uh, and it was actually Jay who gave me the first call. Uh, once he had heard of me and heard about my work ethic, the first call I got was to do a home invasion case out in Arizona that, uh, Jay had already been doing for several months, and that, that's how I broke into it. Wow. Yeah. Learning from one of the for best. Sure. Learning from one of the best, without a doubt. So you, you get involved. Let it, what, what was this home invasion? Was it a crew doing home invasions, and you guys yeah. were infiltrating so, them? You know, Bird had already done uh, most of the hard work, uh, and, and it was one of those crews, and I know you guys have run into them in your careers, one of those crews that was into everything. Uh, they were into everything. They, they, uh, they were selling pipe bombs. They were selling kilos. Uh, they were selling guns. We bought an RPG off these guys. Um, they, they, there was nothing they weren't into. And so, you know, Bird had already worked the majority of the case. And, uh, when it came to doing the home invasion part, these guys were doing home invasions. Now, you know, most of these home invasions are, are stash houses. They're hit. You know, dope. And, uh, you know, so Jay told these guys, listen, I got my own crew. And I want to bring them in. This is a big job. I want to bring my own crew in. So, you know, this crew said, okay. Uh, so there was, there was Jay, there was a guy named Chris Bayless, and a guy named John Babyface Carr. And these dudes were already, like, established. The, the other, you know, Jay and the other two guys were, you know, these were guys that I, I wanted to be, I looked up to. You know, and I was kind of the new guy coming in. Uh so, you know, the bad guys, we flew in and we were in role as the bad guys actually picked us up from the airport in Tucson. And, you know, we were in right away. We we're out there for about two weeks and we just, you know, we, we bought, uh, we actually bought an RPG. We bought a bunch of kilos and some guns and we whipped up this whole home invasion scenario. 
uh, you know, and that, that takes all the planning and, you know, these guys, that's what they did. So obviously they were well in tune with what, what we were planning to hit this stash house. And, uh, you know, the takedown was incredible. It was out, Jay set it up. It was out in the desert. There were sand dunes, a helicopter came up and they were beanbagging these guys. It, I mean, it was like a movie. And this was my first, you know, I had been buying, you know, uh, Lorsons in in alleyways and in in car washes and parking lots and uh you know this was my first intro kind of to the big leagues uh and i did almost blow it i've told I, i'm sure jay didn't bring this part up but they, i did pay a stripper to punch him in the face and uh and and she she actually wadded him up so bad he had to get he had to get stitches in the whole deal so it was almost my it was my first <laughs> and almost my last uh, you know, big big time undercover <laughs> deal, uh, but uh, we were able to patch things up after that. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Wow, uh, talk about like kind of baptism by fire, huh? But uh, you know what? Y- you think about how careers happen and how careers start and how they get going. You need that one break. You need that one little. Hey, someone recognized what I what I'm doing or or you know some of the skills I have. And like you said, for someone like Jay to look at you and go, that's what I want. I want him. Come on, kid, let's go. That says a lot about you and and Jay actually, you know, having the foresight of what you can, you know, your talents and what you can be. But a lot about you with, you know, the way you work. Uh without even knowing your career and just listening to you, you worked your ass off. Absolutely. You can tell you did. And the one thing I'm that really impressed me, Lou, what you said, and you don't see a lot of this in police departments, and Danny and I both went through it. When you get people in certain positions that shouldn't really be there yet, you actually had enough in you to go, you know what? Not yet. Not yet. Let me do this. Let me get to where I want to be. And then saying, okay, now I'm ready. That's rare. That doesn't happen too often. And, and that's really cool that, that you had that about yourself, that kind of inner look of yourself. That's cool. Well, I think it, what it is, is it, it's a selfless act where the job and the work is above your own ego. Because it's easy to accept the assignment to a unit where, or a place where, look at me, I'm with this. But if you don't know what you're doing there, you're not doing any service to that unit. And the mission is what matters, right? And that and that means you're in it for the right reasons. So you know, yeah. uh, Bravo. ATF mm-hmm. has a lot of issues, as you guys know, right? And I'm sure you've dealt with ATF during your careers, and and you know, you know a lot of guys now. Uh, you know, the agency has a lot of issues, and it's had its certainly had its black eyes. Uh, you know, in the over the last three decades, but I I will say this: the ATF Enhanced Undercover Program is the greatest undercover program in the world, and it has the greatest undercover agents in the world. And and I came in, and you know I looked up to these guys. Uh, you know I had already been on streets for eight years, but when I saw the level of professionalism and the results that they were getting, and you know I I was, you know I was a fanboy, uh, and that that's what I knew what I wanted. But, you know, I also knew just from growing up, uh, you know, with a hardcore father and stuff, you pay your dues, man. You know, nothing gets handed to you. You got to earn it. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to try and, uh, you know, jump the gun or, or try to make a name for myself before I felt I was prepared, you know? And I, I think that, I hope that's the way most people should be, especially in law. It should be that way, but a lot of times it's not. It's opportunity and and advancement, and let me get this as quick as I can without really having the the skill set to be where you're at. Uh, the one thing I want to ask you, which I didn't have a chance to ask uh, Jay, but I love asking undercovers this. Dan and I worked with a lot of undercovers, narcotics, the gang unit, uh, you know, sources and all that. When you got into your role, was it just your personality? that you brought into the role or did you kind of become someone or, you know, was there a, an act involved? You know, we knew so many undercovers that were just themselves that just went out, did their thing as themselves. And then we also had some that were characters that, that could come up with these, these crazy, uh, personas, yeah. personas. Yep. Uh, to do. So I, what I, was yours? I was myself, man. I, I'm not an actor. I'm not a method actor. Uh, 
it would be hard for me to to pull off trying to be you know someone else. I I kept it close to home. Uh, you know, I I grew up in a very like Italian neighborhood, and uh, you know, I pulled names from neighborhood names as my undercover name, and and I just acted like uh, a hustler. I learned a lot from my first partner, uh, you know, who kind of instilled in me that the best way to work undercover is not, don't look at it as an infiltration, like that you're trying to become one of them. Look at it as you want them to want to become part of your hustle. That's what you want. I'm not going to infiltrate, you know, the Mexican mafia and pretend I'm a Mexican or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into some real ethnic you know, kind of group and try to be one of them. Uh, even when I was down South, you know, I wasn't going to infiltrate the Dixie mafia and pretend I'm a Southerner, right? It just, my look and it wasn't happening. So I kept it very close to home. You know, I was always that hustler who I, I could buy guns uh, and accumulate a bunch of guns, you know, down here in the Southeast and I could move them up to New York and I could sell them on the street to my gangster buddies and make a ton of money. And that's gun trafficking. And that really happens. As you guys know, from all, you know, all the guns you guys recovered, I guarantee you all the guns you guys were dealing with and recovering over half of them came from the Southeast, right? From Georgia, you know, from the Carolinas, you know? And so gun trafficking was a real thing. So I was a gun trafficker, you know, that, that was basically, you know, a guy from up North, you know, who knew there was a huge profit margin because it's the truth. I, I can buy a Lorson down here a piece of shit Lorson nine millimeters for ninety or a hundred bucks, and I can sell it up there as as a Glock for fifteen hundred, and and it happens all the time as you guys know. And so that you know that was my hustle, and and we took it, you know we would have the backstopping uh, was incredible. I we had, you know I had moving trucks, and uh, you know I would show these guys. Listen, you know I it would be full of furniture. I'd be like you know this is. You know, I'm moving. I'm moving a family from Atlanta to New York. So when I get about 200 guns, what I do, you know, I secrete the guns and I hide them inside their furniture. And then when it gets up there, you know, we we get them out before we deliver the furniture. I said, if you know, if Johnny Law, you know, sticks their nose on I-95, pulls us over, in worst case scenario, they find the guns. I say, listen, I'm just moving furniture. I, I don't know, you know, who these people are, or why there's guns. And these guys, they were like, right on, man. You know, they got it. We had. We had all sorts of traps and we had all sorts of shit that made it look real. So we would go really in depth for our cover stories to fit who we said we were. That's fascinating. You do have to do the background work. You do have to have um, that credibility. And that credibility comes, you know, because if you're dealing at any given level with criminals, they're going to smell. They're going to smell nervousness. They're going to smell rookie mistakes. They're going to smell a story that doesn't make sense. It's got to make sense. It's got to be tested and it's got to be something that's just a part of who you are naturally to flow out because you're right. If you're doing a, a street corner buy, you can limp down and pretend you got a limp and you can mess your face up and you can talk slightly differently for 90 seconds to get a buy and get on, get off the set. But if you're doing undercover work where you're spending time with people, you're developing relationships, you've got to have it be some version of yourself that's yourself. And all that story has got to be worked out. The ID has got to be legit. Things have got to be... A, you have to imagine criminal organizations have the ability to check you out. So that's all got to totally. look. That's going to yeah, look you're, good. If you're going to say yeah. something as simple as, yeah, I'm a convicted felon or something, you, you better damn well know the prison system. You better know the terminology. Yeah. Right? You know, because the guys mm -hmm. you're dealing with have yep. been through yep. this prison system. And then when they start asking questions, you better know or, or they're going to flush yeah. you out right away. Yep. Where'd you do your time? You say, you say a place they got buddies. You Absolutely. may have stepped in deep to right. Yeah. It's all about homework, right? How much homework gets involved? It's a lot of it, stuff. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, yeah, it's overwhelming. Yep. Well, I was I never was an undercover per se, but I did do one operation on a case of mine, and it was actually in Hong Kong. And I did a lot of research to make sure everything I was going to say to those people over there, my DEA partner and I, everything was checked out. I mean, I wasn't leaving anything to chance and a fake ID down to the story to who I worked for and what I did and who I was associated with, the snitches and what their backgrounds were. Everything had to be, I could not stammer for a second. You know, it, um, and along those lines, you know, some of the greatest uh, undercovers with ATF are task force guys, right? They're guys from 
NYPD, you know, from LA County Sheriff, you know, who, who come over as task force guys and they, they just knock it out of the park. Um, even better than a lot of the agents, you know? Well, I think Tom and I can both attest to some of the people that we worked with in the PD and the narcotic side and, and, and even the gang side, they could convince you yep. that you were on fire. They could make you sell them anything. They could outstreet you. If you thought you were a tough street guy, they were, you know, it just was amazing. And a lot of them came from those backgrounds, grew up around that. So it was part of them and they could tap into it in a second. Um, and they knew exactly how to act to stay out of trouble, how to, how to tone a situation down, um, how to avoid suspicion. So, so, you know, doing any kind of casework and Tom's team of narcotics did a lot of casework. And I worked at the DEA and it's like, you got to be good. You got to be convincing. You have to be seen by them as an equal or, like you said, somebody they aspire to hang out with. Like uh, Louis B. we had on the show who, who did uh, work when I was with Organized Crime Unit. Louis would talk to people because he grew up with, with mafia. He grew up with them. He almost became one. He could talk to them on their level and he knew people that they knew. And he'd say, Sally says hi. That's, and that's yeah. it. Done. Because he grew up with them. He knew how to talk to people. And he knew what was important to them, and he knew how to get them interested. And a lot of it is keeping a mystery. A lot of it is just, you know, you don't show everything, throwing names no, around right away. Bad guys don't Nobody do, would that, do that. Right? Bad guys don't show their cards, you know? And, and so it, it's always a balancing act, working undercover. And, you know, you, everyone has different personalities. So, that, you know, a lot of us, you know, we had different styles and different ways of doing it. Uh, but, I, you know, the one thing in common, uh, is that I think the really good undercovers knew what not to say. You know what I mean? When to keep their mouth shut, what not to say. Like B.B. King once said, like, the greatest guitar player knows when not to play, right? You know, and, and I always felt that way about undercover work. Um, have, a, have a presence, uh, but don't run your mouth because the real bad guys that you guys ever dealt with and, and you know, all the real bad... You know, they don't run their mouths. They don't tell people their business, you know? So if you go in there running your mouth and, and pounding your chest, you're not going to last long. Wow. That's so true. It's so true. Less is more, pretty much, you know, and just know. And, and that goes into, again, the homework. You know, a lot of people out there think you're an undercover. Okay, let me just go and buy this or do this. There is so much work that goes into an operation. Uh like yours. I mean, it's incredible. So speaking of operations, let's get into the storefronts. They are, I mean, I saw it on the show and you're going to talk about your show. Fascinating concept, how it was put together. And take us through that because I just, I couldn't wait to hear it from you. Like you watch a show, it's great, but hear it from you of how it came about, the idea, everything about that. Uh, the first thing that I'll say is that you know, we certainly didn't create the storefront, right? And again, that the the first really successful storefronts were done by the NYPD, uh, and that was you know that's back in the fifties and sixties, uh, and and those were they were mostly geared toward uh, you know fencing and, and stolen merchandise, that kind of stuff, and and you know they kind of created the template uh, for these for these kind of operations. You know, all we did was we kind of took them. Uh, and, and just expanded them and, and put more into them, you know, more, uh, resources and all that. And, and what I did was I was able to, the storefronts that I did, I, I fell into the first one. And, uh, again, that wasn't even ATF. Okay. That was the Richmond County Sheriff's Department who are, they're the police in, uh, Augusta, Georgia. They had jammed up a tattoo, uh, a, a guy who happened to be a tattoo artist. He had tattooed everyone in prison. Uh, that was his thing. And they flipped him and he said, you know, he'll, he'll do anything to stay out. And they came up with the idea of doing a tattoo shop as a store. The gang problem uh, in Augusta, Georgia was huge. You know, you think of Augusta, Georgia with the masters and all that shit. It, it's actually kind of a shithole city, gang infest. Uh, so they, they just needed some undercover work, you know, because they couldn't use their guys, you know because they were so well known. So I kind of, I was asked to do it and I came into it and 
I, I had I didn't know what to expect, but I, I never said no. I, I worked nonstop under Curry. If someone asked me to do something, I was doing, no matter what. If I was working. 12 hours that day, if I had four more hours, I would come help you and do the undercut. So I went out there and not knowing what to expect. And they had set up a great spot, man. It was a real shady looking tattoo shop. Uh, you know, ATF came in to help with the setup and all that. And before I knew it, you know, I, I was the manager at a tattoo shop and, and the informant was the, you know, he was the tattoo artist and he, he was a shit show course but he was really good and and he, you know he knew all the rap music and all that he knew all the different gangs and he was getting these guys in there to, to tattoo him and then it was up to me and, and the undercovers at that point you know to engage in in uh you know criminal activity with these guys. and it just it's spider web you know we started buying a little bit of dope and and you know a couple guns here and there we got to know which gangs were which and uh and, and, you know, we let everyone know this was neutral territory, man, you know, and, uh, you know, everyone was welcome, but you guys know how, how long that shit lasts, right? Um, you know, we had gang wars in there, fist fights and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was out of control, but we kept, you know, we kept it in line and we were really getting harassed by the local cops who didn't know, you know, you know, we, their one unit didn't tell anyone else, you know, that it was going on. And uh, so we, we were dealing from all that, all this stuff from the outside. But before I knew it, we had bought 430 crime guns off the streets. And, and you know, as much dope as we could afford, we had bought. And we had over 100 defendants. It really, I, I was like, wow, I've been doing all these long-term infiltrations that take two or three years, and I'm wrapping up three or four people. I just worked for less than 12 months and I wrapped up over a hundred like quality defendants, you know, multi-convicted gown bangers. And I was like, you know, this, I'm getting a lot of bang for the buck with these operations. And the next thing we knew, we we're getting phone calls from people. Hey, we heard what happened in Augusta, you know, can you do one in my city? And so there was kind of an evolution to these cases because everyone I did, um, I wanted it to be better than the last one. And so it almost went from, uh, you know, a, a street level, you know, the tattoo shop was very street level to through the evolutions and the multiple ones that I did, you know, by the end, I, I was working on international gun traffickers, cartels. You know, we really picked up our game from, you know, driving the old hoopty that I was driving at the tattoo shop, you know, to driving you know, a brand new Jaguar as a freight forwarder, you know, on my last one, it, there really was an evolution and, uh, they just kept getting bigger and better. You know, a lot of mistakes were made, but the results were, were, were spot on. Um, you know, they just, they're not happening anymore, unfortunately, but what, what a great tool, what a great investigative tool to help clean up a city or a portion of a city, you know? Yeah, an awesome concept. Rather than going out and chasing the criminals, bring them to you. Bring them to you. It's it's about as safe. They can, yeah, they flock it, to you. You know, for undercover work, it's about as safe as you can get. Yeah, it's, it's never safe, as you guys know. You know, with a bad guy with a gun, right? It's never. But at least we controlled the venue, and and more importantly, we controlled the electronic surveillance. So it was it was so nice after after you know work twelve years of you know wiring up and wearing all this. It was so nice to not have to do that because everything was already set, you know, and, and the quality was always perfect. It was like watching television with the, with the, uh, you know, the tapes that we were getting. So yeah, it's a, it's about as, uh, it's about as safe and as, uh, I guess controlled as a, as an undercover operation can be a storefront. So I have a question for you. You got all those cameras set up. You're in there. Cameras are rolling constantly, right? There's got to be a, a blooper reel. There's got to be something you guys put together of the goofiest moments or the funniest things or whatever. There has to be, all right? I mean, somewhere somebody's watching the funny moments, people slipping in, whatever. It's it, Whatever it is that happened, because put a bunch of cops or agents together in a room long enough and funny stuff is going to happen. So tell so me that. In every that case, there, there was a blooper reel 
that the uh, the control yeah. the control room uh, guys and girls would put together, and uh, it was always embarrassing. Um, it usually involved alcohol and, and bad behavior, and uh, but but yes, you know, and and those unfortunately those moments were kind of few and far between. Uh, there there was not a lot of downtime on, you know, we we were doing. 10, 12 deals a day in these things. And, uh, you know, they, the hours were, were just sick. And, you know, after being open for 10 hours or whatever, you know, now you got a couple hours of report writing and logging in evidence and all that shit. So it really, they, they drained, they, they were very life draining um, doing these operations then just rolling from one to, an, to the next one. Uh, they, they were brutal, but the results we got, man, they, they were, they were great. And, and the, the best part for me was, no matter where we did these, we paired up, you know, with the city police department. Um, and we just got to work with like, you know, the, the best people. And we were right there and we were making a direct impact on the community. You know, that, that was the best part for me because it sounds corny, but taking crime guns off the street meant something to me. Buying dope didn't mean much, right? I bought, I, I, I don't even know how much, how many hundreds and thousands of kilos over my career but that doesn't you guys know that that doesn't make a difference right that's that's a drop in the bucket in these cartels but you know one crime gun out of some thug's hand that makes a difference in the community you know and, and that's really what we were doing and, and it meant so and that was that was my next question uh obviously you're locking the people up for you know what they're doing with the guns and selling them and all that how many how many times did you get into a conversation with the bad guy about the gun that led to other crimes or other cases getting closed? I mean, they had to have come in and felt somewhat comfortable with you. Perps talk, all right? They talk all the time. So was there even circumstances that other cases got closed because of that In gun? Every single storefront we did, we solved a shitload of, of robberies and assaults. Because these guys would come in on camera and brag about it. Uh, and sometimes it would be like the most the memorable one that just pops up is a guy, super violent dude who we didn't even enjoy when this guy came in. He was a time bomb. And uh, he came in one time, actually the last time he came in, covered in blood, man. He had a white t-shirt covered in blood. And he told us he had just stabbed a dude, right? He, he went home. And some guy was, was uh, banging his girlfriend. And so he took a knife out and he stabbed him. And he came in directly into us right after he did it and confessed, he confessed to the whole thing. And we were, we were just sitting, you know, I was behind the counter like, why the fuck are you here, man? Like, why, why, why do you come here? You're going to bring the heat on us, man. Like, get the fuck out of here, dude. You know, but, and they were able to get him and use that you know, use that against them. But yeah, it happened all the time. We had guys who were, they would even tell us, uh, we had guys selling us fentanyl and, and stuff that was pharmaceutical grade. And they would brag to us how they had, they were doing, they were doing nighttime burglaries at pharmacies and smashing grabs and taking this shit. And then they would sell it to us. Uh, you know, that was something that, you know, there was always in, in a store fight, we were very always concerned with creation of crime, right? We didn't want to create crime. You know, because we had had this venue, and you know, these guys knew we bought guns, we bought dope. You know, we didn't want we didn't want guys going out and and robbing houses and shit. You know, to get guns to come sell it to us because now you're creating. You know, we were trying to buy guns that were already out on the street, uh, so we were always very careful about that. But when these guys would come in, and you guys know how it is, they love bragging, man, and they'll tell you once once they know you're dirty like them. They would just run their mouse and, and it would close out, you know, all the cops working in the cover room or, or the other undercover guys who were cops, they would tape that and they would send it to whatever unit and wrap it up. And it was beautiful. Yeah, that's fantastic. No, uh, no Miranda involved in that. No interrogation, no custody. The freely given statement. Yep. And a store run by somebody who's got every right to have the cameras Damn and right. audio rolling. That's fantastic. That's great to hear. But it's so true about criminals. I mean, especially if you have, you know, there's one thing to be a quiet, sneaky criminal and break into people's houses in the daytime. Those guys tend to be junkies and they don't talk much. But 
if you're a crook and a perp and a, and a you know a gangster kind of guy, you want to brag. And when you get somebody you feel you can brag, now I'm telling you, I'm a tough guy. I'm a big deal. I'm a tough guy. You deal. I'm a serious guy. You deal with me this way, and they feel great about themselves when they're telling you about their accomplishments. Especially if they're trying to sell you a gun that eh, I don't know, it might be dirty and it might be hot, but I want to get rid of it, right? It, what do you mean it might be hot? Well, it might have been used in a shooting. I'm not saying, but you know, you got you got to love people who do that, and it, a lot of it's just bravado and BS. But when you get that real nugget oh, of beautiful. truth, that's a home. Run. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. They have the right to remain silent, but not the ability. <laughs> that's the problem. For sure. <laughs> you say that all the time. <laughs> True. Yep. Oh, man. So, so was there... Go ahead, Dan. No, I was just going to say, uh, you did the storefronts. How long was the storefront operations and approximately how many of them did you guys do? Did yeah. them all across the so country? The, uh, the first one we kicked off um, that, that was kind of the, the catalyst uh, for these going up all over the country. Uh, that was in Georgia, and that one was uh, about 2008. And then they started popping up. And eventually, uh, the undercover program um, sent me around the country, as I was doing my own, sent me around the country to help other agents um, set up and get them going and make sure you know they were doing the right thing. And so I was, I was lucky enough to be able to jump in and do the undercover and help, you know, other guys and girls out all over the country. I mean, there were some incredible ones that were done on the West Coast, uh, Long Beach and LA and, uh, in Vegas, um, Albuquerque. I mean, I, I went all over the country and I, w- I would just basically, you know, I had to write a report that went back to, uh, the undercover program that said, yeah, they're checking all the boxes and all that. But in reality, I just, I would go out there and I would jump in and, and help these guys or girls out with the undercover, you know, just as a partner. And, and I loved it, man. It was great. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, like everything good, um, you know, th- there's a window, you know, Congress got very sideways with these operations and, you know, they about probably about 2016 or 17, uh, right about when I retired. You know, they just ETF. They were getting heat from Congress, and they just said, "Oh, we're done," and that that was it. So now, the storefronts like a dirty word. If you go to a, a a U.S. attorney's office or a district attorney's office uh, and say storefront, they'll they'll show you the door. It's a dirty word now. Yeah. Well, there's always political pressure behind all of that. When politics get involved in law enforcement, I think you're. Your agency, the ATF, is is the highlight example of that. Recently, them, well, other three letters, but uh, we had a we had a, th- a thing in the, in the NYPD back when Tom's dad was with the department called the Stakeout Squad. Now, at the time, crime was completely out of control in New York City, and the department, being unlike what police departments are today, was very practical in certain ways. Like, well, you know, we'll address crime, we'll meet force with overwhelming force. They had such a problem with robberies of businesses to the point where they set up what's called the stakeout squad and two man teams, uh, plain clothes, shotguns, handguns would go and sit in the back of certain stores in neighborhoods where a lot of robberies were going on. And they got to the point where they killed so many people robbing stores. They had to shut it down. It got to be like ridiculous uh, because, you know, but whose fault is that? Is it the police department's fault that people are robbing stores at gunpoint? No, but I think they had, you know, you had some Vietnam vets that came back and they were like, yep, I'm okay with killing. And <laughs> they put them in the back stores and they were like, boom, blowing people left and right out of their socks who were coming in and not listening to the order to put the gun down. Well, that's more an exa- that's more um, a statement of what's going on in society than it is a statement about policing. But nonetheless, police department was told, dial it down, don't do it anymore. We're not going to be killing people. To me, what you just described uh, sounds like a great solution to a really bad problem. You, you should think if you're going to rob a store with a weapon, uh, and we, you know, Tom and I both saw this work in the neighborhoods with a lot of bodegas. I, I, I don't know if there's a bodega in Manhattan or, or the Bronx or Brooklyn doesn't have a gun behind a counter. Uh, and I kind of don't blame them. They get robbed all the time. But what is an 18 year old kid with a, a Raven 25 stolen? You mentioned that before. They're so common on the street. Um, 
walks into a store to rob a bodega, if he thinks he's going to get shot by a guy with a uh, a fifty caliber or something, by Desert Eagle, or whatever, a forty four Magnum behind the counter, he's probably not going to go in and rob that bodega. He's going to find someplace else to rob. You make yourself a hard target, and you send the message. And the criminal community, they all talk. They all know. Don't even think about doing that because you'll get killed. That's it. And so they go someplace else for their money. It, it is a deterrent. They, we, we speak in terms of when it comes to crime deterrence and all this kind of stuff and the public's appetite. We speak in terms of like we're talking with regular people. Diehard criminals, career criminals, people. These people would slit your throat as soon as talk to you. They would step over your dead body to get to something that's your property. These are not the kind of people that you can have these nice, safe approaches with. They just don't respond to it. They respond to force and force alone. And when you hang out with criminals long enough, you realize that. And um, it, it's a shame to see how certain political moves have gone that have been so, they were so easy on it now. It's ridiculous. And it's a free-for-all. And we're seeing oh, it in our we're, cities, we're right? We're doomed. I, I hate it. You know, the, the big thing with, you know, the storefronts, of course, with Congress eventually became the whole racial thing, right? And, and my argument and what, what I wish ATF would, they would have stood up and argued this was, we're not putting these places up just like haphazardly. We're not closing our eyes and sticking a pin in the map and putting up the storefront. We were doing it through uh, analytics, right? We, would, we were compiling all, okay, listen, this area of the Bronx, here's the gun crime statistics, gun recoveries, right? Uh, armed robberies, right? We're compiling all the statistics and we were only opening up storefronts where there was bad gun problems. So if, if you know, all the defendants happen to be of a one race, so be it, because that's where the gun problem is. That means all the victims are all the good people in that community, right? Who make up the majority of that community and they're good people and they're the victims, right? What about the victims? You know, they wanted to shut these down, uh, you know, using the whole selective prosecution thing. And my argument was always, listen, we're trying to help the community. That's the whole reason for a storefront is to make that community safe. And that's what we were doing because we're getting the trigger pull. So, you know, I never heard that shit when I was doing, if I did a outlaw motorcycle gang, right? And, and all the defendants were white. I never heard any complaints or any selective prosecution being brought up uh, by the defense. So it, it's got to work both ways. You know, we're doing this to help that community. And, and I don't, none of us, as you guys know, as cops, we, we, I didn't care if they were all Chinese, if they were all Irish, uh, Puerto Rican, it doesn't matter to me. Shitheads are shitheads. And that's who we're going at. I, ne I never discriminated. I could care less what you look like. I cared about what you did. And we've said it so many times on this show, Dan, and it gets nauseating saying it, but once again, when politics gets involved in law enforcement, things go wrong and things don't proceed the way they should because of that political realm. And it happens all the time. There's not one instance, one example that politics gets involved in law enforcement and it works. No. Never. Never. And and who suffers? Communities, communities suffer. Communities where crimes are happening and murders are happening and robberies are happening, that's who suffers over that nonsense. Actually, there's, there's one, uh, one outlier to that, and that's when Giuliani became mayor of New York and politics, his politics came in and he said, we're going to take the city back. That was that was the one example that's different, I think, in in recent history. Uh, but you're right. Other than that, it's always to appease a certain group or a certain agenda. And what happens is cops get told, "Don't do A, don't do B, don't look at A." And you got to be law has to be law enforcement has to be colorblind. It has to be situational. This person did this. He's he's getting locked up. Period. Person blew a red light. He's getting a ticket. I've period. talked throughout throughout my career that all the all the people you saw who were like out there on the news grandstanding and, and saying, you know, the, the law enforcement is, is doing this and all, they, they never cared about the victim. They never mentioned the victim, you know, um, you know, let's boohoo and let's cry about this armed robber who's being unjustly, you know, uh, persecuted, but they never, they would never mention the victim. What about the victims, you know? And that, that's why we're really out there to help the victims of violent crimes, man. 
it gets lost somewhere. It gets lost. And, and unfortunately, our agencies, our departments, sometimes they bow to the pressure. Almost always, they bow to the pressure and they just shut all these good things down. You know, all the all the great programs that the NYPD had installed and and that ATF and LAP, you know, all these great programs we started that were very effective. The departments just they just kind of bend over when there's a little pushback from some fringe group and uh and then who like you just said who pays the price you know the atf uh not to gloss over this you had a mandate that was broad enough to allow you to work in a lot of different cases almost any kind of crime that popped up across your radar you didn't have to hand it off you did it so people don't think atf agents are out there buying drugs in other capacity you are they don't think you're accepting stolen goods as part of uh, a storefront, but you are. Whereas the DEA agent might not get involved in a certain case. They stay strictly on the drugs and money laundering and, and things that go with it. But um, you guys had a broad mandate. And that that's kind of, you know, we did in the NYPD too. Uh, if you work in narcotics division, you're supposed to do drug cases. But if if part of it is, is a stolen credit card ring, we're running with it. Or part of it is this or that, or is a homicide. You know, the other units get involved. but you don't stop. I love that about the ATF. You guys are the cowboys that just follow the crime and guns are involved in all of it. So that's, you hang your hat on that. There's no such thing as a criminal organization that protects its assets and its, its domains and all that stuff without guns. Weapons are the tools of the trade. And, you know, I was lucky. Uh, you know, we had a very long leash, very long. And, and when, once we got into something, uh, you know, my last storefront operation, we took down the biggest stolen car uh, operation on the East Coast. Um, it was, it, it was, of course, it was out of New York, um, and they were bringing the cars down, and they were titling them in South Carolina, and then they were shipping them uh, out of the ports of Georgia and Florida uh, to South America. And uh, and the, the greatest part about that. Part of the operation was that the FBI had been on to this stolen car ring for like two or three years, but of course nothing was happening. And uh, we were able, we worked <laughs> these guys, indicted, arrested, and convicted them. And the FBI didn't find out about it until it was in the papers, which that, that was one of the most satisfying uh, uh, days of my career. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, for, just for example, I don't mean to shit on the FBI, but they deserve it. You know, if an FBI agent has a case in New York and you know, all of a sudden, you know, that case takes him to Toledo, Ohio, you know, that's the next step. They're done. They have to send, they have to forward the 312s or whatever to Toledo. And then some agent who knows nothing about it in Toledo has to pick it up and run with it. You know, the great thing about HF is that my case started in Atlanta, you know, and it, you know, it took me to, um, you know, Grand Rapids, Michigan, you know, my ass was on a plane. I'm going up there and I'm, I'm going to run with, uh, you know, like, so, we we had a lot of leeway, and you used the term cowboys, and we really were. I mean, we were. We had a we had such a crew, and and we were really making a difference. And we were getting putting violent criminals uh, behind bars. We had a great run. Um, you know, with this, uh, we still have some great men and women in the undercover program, and, and they're still doing as much as they can. But as you guys know. All law enforcement across the board, just they're not doing what we did a decade ago. Um, and that, not because of them, but because of the, the just, I guess, the, the climate today. Right. Right. So with all that being said, how does the legendary 26-year career of Lou Velozzi come to an end? It was- How, why? Yeah. Like a dumpster fire, man. Uh, it uh you know i i uh i barely crawled over the finish line i so i i uh had started working on um, regular cases like uh just regular undercover cases you know maybe three four month undercover cases and i'm doing that in between uh storefront operations and then if I'm getting a call from uh, a buddy in Chicago, hey, we need you on this, you know, could you do this? It's, we got a mafia case up here. 
uh, we got guns or whatever. Can you come up here? Absolutely. And I'm doing that. And I'm, I'm on weekends going back to something else. So I had uh, definitely become a little bit uh, obsessed with what I was doing and kind of buying into, you know, my whole, the whole persona uh, to the detriment of definitely of, of my personal life, my family, my friends and all that. Uh, so once, once you go down that road, uh, and you're in the undercover business, you know, it's a house of cards and, and that card's going to get pulled eventually. Um, I, I guess the only comforting thing I can say about it is that I wasn't the only one, you know, I looked to my right and left and, and these guys were doing the same bullshit that I was doing. Um, you know, excessive drinking, uh, you know, not exactly uh, being good family, you know, fathers and husbands and all that. Uh, so, but you don't realize it when you're in it, right? I it, I can look back now and, and see it, but when you're in it, the only thing that mattered was the next case, right? My next case had to be bigger and better. And, you know, I look at like, hey, man, Dobbins, Dobbins just, you know, he just took down a crew in Phoenix, you know, and he got, you know, he, he sees hundred guns had 20, 25 defendants. And even though I was happy for him, I was like, well, I'm going to outdo that. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get 27 guns and 101 defendants. Right. You know, we had that, that healthy competition that all cops had. Right. Uh, and you know, Jay always says this and it's true. We're, we're always, all of us, the first to give everyone else credit and, and to tell everyone how great the other guys are. But deep down, we all believed that, that we were the best. Right. You know, and again, this was for work. It was kind of a healthy thing, but it, it led to, uh, I think it definitely me and, and a lot of my, a lot of my brothers and sisters, um, down an unhealthy road. And, uh, so for me in particular, it led to just excessive drinking, um, never being home, uh, unfortunately infidelity. And, uh, by the, you know, and that was, you know, at that point, that was just part of the job, right? I mean, that was just part of it. And it, all the, you know, I was locking people up. So none of that other shit really mattered, right? Cause I, I was doing God's work in my, in my mind. And, uh, you know, by the end, it all kind of came to a, came to a head, uh, in this last big operation, which, which to me and to many people, the greatest it was the greatest storefront operation ever that's ever been conducted. Um, the, we, like I said before, I, I was a freight forwarder. Uh, the crew around me, they were just incredible. And we were getting into Bolivian gun smugglers, uh, that stolen car ring, just cartels, uh, the Sinaloa cartel. Um, and uh you know but along with that when you're experiencing all that success you know there there's always you know how we are as cops right the the, the bad behavior always kind of goes along with uh the success right and um you know when it when it all came kind of came to a head there were there were some allegations like there always are in every long term operation allegations of, of bad behavior and improprieties and all that uh and again, I, I like to. I love what Jay says. I'm going to go back to what Jay always says. We always took the law very seriously, the laws, but we we took ATF policy and procedure as mere suggestions. Right? You know, that's just how we. That's how we did it. Because in order to be successful, that's how you had to. And uh, and in that last operation, it all kind of came to a head. And when when uh, accusations started flying around, and, and you know, people start doing this. Uh, it, it came out with me in particular about an affair with the, the federal prosecutor on the case. And, and that just, that blew up my whole world. And uh, it, it blew up my career, obviously. And uh, put, I found myself under investigation. Um, and, you know, I, I found myself uh, for the first time in my life. And, and you know how we are. We're A personalities, right? Type A. And, and we're always in control of everything. I found myself, I wasn't in control of anything. I was no longer in control. I, you know, 
I couldn't control the investigation on me. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't have any answers. And it broke me down. Uh, it really broke me down. Uh, so I kind of crashed professionally and I crashed personally. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, incredibly vindictive. Um, you know, I, I certainly wasn't the first agent or cop, you know, to, you know, have something with a coworker or a prosecutor or whatever, but they, you know, they, maybe it's cause it's, it was down here and it was uh, kind of a good old boy network down here. And the, uh, you know, she wasn't very popular because of that. They really, they came after me hard, um, all sorts of accusations. Um, and I, I was, I didn't know what to do. ATF got me out of the hot seat. They, they, they put me in, uh, at the National Center for Explosives and Training Research in Alabama, in Huntsville, uh, just kind of get me out of the hot seat. And, uh, I mean, it actually came to the point where the United States Attorney's Office sent me a target letter. Uh, you guys know what a target letter is, uh, federally? Yeah, that's when it says, it said, United States of America versus Lou Veloso. And, you know, after being a cop for a quarter century, to, to look at that, to read that, I, I can't even tell you the feeling. Like, I mean, I had given my life, everything, you know, to this, to this cause and, and to the government. And then to see how quick, how quick they turned around on me, um, you know, instead of kind of, instead of kind of pulling me aside and saying, hey, let's, you know, what's going on? Let's talk about this. You know, tell us what, you know, they, they came after me. Um, and, and tried to put a case on, uh, and, and they use what they always do when they really don't have anything. As you guys know, when law enforcement doesn't really have anything, they always go for false statements, right? That's the catch all, right? Like, I mean, that's what got Martha Stewart. They didn't get her for cheating on her taxes. They got her for making a false statement in the interview. So, so they, they started investigating me and, you know, they, they went way out of the scope, right? They're, they're, interviewing people from 10 years ago on these undercover cases I did, what they were trying to do was they were looking at my testimony in court and trying to find inconsistencies. So I would have guys calling me up saying, hey, you know, this was like a tech guy who had placed cameras uh, in, in one of my operations. He'd say, man, I just got interviewed by OIG and they're asking me if I remember exactly where I put the camera. Because during your testimony, you had said that it was in this spot and, and they wanted to See, maybe it wasn't in that spot. I mean, that's how, you know, they don't put this much effort into a murder, right? And, uh, and, and so I was like, I mean, that's another thing that sent me spinning out of control because, you know, I know these people, right? I'm a, I've been a part of this system and I know when they really want to get someone, they're going to get them on something no matter what. And so that, that's another thing that just made me spit out of control. So meanwhile, I'm, I'm dealing with all this professionally, you know, worried about my pension, worried about my insurance and my kids, my marriage. And I, I really don't have anyone, you know, I can't really turn to my wife at this point. And, uh, you know, the only people that I had to turn to were, were my brothers and sisters in the undercover program, uh, you know, who, who stood by me and, and, you know, everyone I ever worked with. Uh, stood by me, but, but it's a hard thing when you're, as you guys know, when you're in the mix and, and you're, you know, you're working your cases and you know, those phones are ringing off the hook and you're it, right. You know, you got informants calling you, you got bad guys calling you, you know, you got your boss, all that. My phone went silent overnight. Done. No, the, the phones were done. Nobody was calling. And, and so everything happened at once and uh, it, it was overwhelming to not be in control. And so, uh, at that point, I knew I was never going to work undercover again. Uh, obviously no one at that point is going to put me up on the stand. Um, you know, and, and the shit had hit the internet, it hit the papers. And I knew deep down I hadn't done anything wrong. Oh, uh, you know, and even, even, uh, one of my partners got pulled aside by a guy who was the head of IA for ATF. And he said, listen, we looked at everything. You know, Lou didn't do anything wrong. Uh, we're not the morality police, you know, uh, with the other thing. He said, but we really, we can't do anything to help. Because OIG, once OIG takes over, it's out of our hands. So what I basically did at that point um, 
was make a decision that the most important thing in my life was to get my family. Right. You know, I, 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 there's been some serious neglect on my part and I had to get my family back. Uh, so as soon as the investigation was over, which was two years, as soon as it was over and I was cleared and there was no allegations against me, everything was found to be good. And I was cleared at that point I retired. And that's when I kind of, you know, I had already started, you know, to win back the trust, you know, of my family. And, you know, to, you can never make up for that time you lose with your kids, but I did everything I could to, you know, from that point on to be there and, uh, kind of start building my life back together. And that's kind of how the whole book thing came out. Uh, A buddy of mine just said, a buddy of mine who was a, a cop here in Savannah said, man, write a book, just do it for a mental health thing. And, uh, you know, that's how, that's how all that started. And I kind of got this second career going here. What a story. Thank you very much. And uh, I know our audience got a lot of that. You're not the first person we've had on the show and far from the first that we know, including ourselves, that have had trials and things that you go through, um, hitting that brick wall in life and in law enforcement, even doing it long enough. When it when when you turn around and realize that you have given so much of your life to an organization and a profession that would replace your locker and your desk in five minutes, and you look at your kids and your family, go, I should be home more instead of working overtime and getting on planes and stuff. At least you you had that realization. It wasn't one you came to on your own, right? It was kind of thrust upon you, but at least you had it. And um, wow, a compelling story. I, I'm glad that you are on the other side of it now and uh, you're able to share your story and thank you for being as candid as you have been. And I just want to, you know, we, we love the concept of people being open about, especially those of us who have done this kind of work and your work has been even more intense in many ways as an undercover, deep undercover. But if you've done this kind of work and you need help, get it, reach out for it, ask for it. Don't sit around thinking it's going to get better on its own. It doesn't. And you need people. And we tend to go, we tend to isolate, right? We tend to turn to ourselves and we say, I got this. Me and the bottle, we got this. No, you don't. You might have it that night, but it's, it's not the way to go. We want to see lives turned around and, and, and renewed and restored because it's a, rough, it's a rough thing to go through a career in law enforcement. Doing it at the level that you did, man, um, I'm just really happy. And I'm proud to call you a friend now, and I and I I want to thank you for sharing that story. And I want people who are listening, you know, if you get any kind of struggles like that with life, no, you can come out on the other side of it, and you will eventually. But lean on people, lean on your faith, lean on you know professionals. Do what you have to do, but That's don't right. do it alone. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, speaking at, at law enforcement conferences uh, all over the country, and I I always close with. You know, I tell these, yeah, I, cause I look out, you can look out when you got a group of 700 cops, you can feel the uh, stress, right? And the anxiety, the strain in the room, you know, these are usually like gang conferences or, you know, and I'm looking out and you know, the kind of life these guys are living, the life that you guys live, right? It's nonstop. It's all the time. And, you know, the point I always try to get across, I, I tell my story, you know, what happened to me and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't cover anything up. I'm not proud of a lot of it, but I, you know, it is what it is. And I always say, listen, at the end, um, you know, when you're, when you're on your death, uh, who's going to be there, right? The, the New York city police department's not going to be there holding your hand, right? Or ATF's not going to be there when you're on your deathbed. The people around you, when you go home, those, those that's who's going to be there by your side. So that has to be your priority. It has to, no matter how important the, the case you're working on right now is, it's not more important than your wife, husband, kids, uh, best friends, uh, you know, those mom and dad, those around you. That, we lose sight of that because we, we're doing God's work. And we lose sight of that more than any other profession. We lose sight of it. Um, you don't know, no, you wouldn't understand, right? All that. But, but I, you know, I, I 
tell everyone, I say, don't lose sight of the what's most important in your life and who's going to be there because the most important thing to you should be your pension. That should be the most important thing in that you have to live a long, healthy life so that you can collect the pension that you're owed for years and decades. That's the most important thing. I mean, go to work and work your ass off and do your job and, and you know, make the community safer, but make damn sure you go home at night and, and tell everyone you love. That's what's mostly important. Amen. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I lost, you know, I lost sight of that uh, for, God, for years and years. And uh, le- like, you know, like Dan, like you said, it didn't just all of a sudden open up. You know, I had to get punched in the face for, you know, for that to hit me. But, but thank God I did, right? And, and it did hit me. So, you know, I hope when I talk to people, when I talk to our brothers and sisters in law enforcement, you know, and, and they hear my story and I tell them that, I hope that that message is getting through. I really do. Yeah. Well, very, very powerful, very powerfully shared. Thank you. Um, what do you have going on? What do you want to tell the audience about that you have going on that we want them to hear and see and learn about your story's experience and the things that you're doing, which are fascinating. So please let, tell us what you got going on, Lou. Yeah. So I, you know, through the book, uh, and I wasn't really looking for this, um, uh, you know, I had already had my little after being invisible for decades, uh, all of a sudden, you know, my name was in the paper and on the internet. So, you know, I had already had my little brush with the press and, and it wasn't very good. So I certainly wasn't looking for any more. But uh, when the book came out or as it was coming out, uh, this guy who owned, he owned South Magazine, his name is Michael Brooks. And he approached me and said, man, I, I would love to I would love to do your story. You know, it, it's a regional magazine, great magazine down here, Georgia, Carolinas, Florida. And uh, he said, man, I want to put you on the cover and, and just tell your story. And I told him, I was like, ah, and I said, no, I, I, I've already been in the papers, you know, and uh, it didn't work out very well. But eventually, you know, he talked me into it and I did it. And uh, kind of through that, uh, I started getting phone calls from like reality shows, you know, producers. Uh, you know, asking me if I'd be interested in doing this or that. And, uh, and most of them were really goofy and, you know, kind of would have made me look like a clown a little bit, um, I thought. So I, I didn't want to do it until until I had some producers say, listen, we want to make a show highlighting the great work that police departments do all over the country, you know, with kind of an undercover angle. You know, would you be interested in hosting something like that? And I said, yes, I would. I would. I said, it's long. You know, this was Discovery Channel. And, you know, they, historically, they, they portray law enforcement in a positive light. And these producers, particularly very law enforcement, uh, support. So, you know, now from that conversation to the time that we actually got a show was four years and that, that's how TV land works. Nothing happens fast. Um, it it is the most aggravating business. Um, I I've never met people who, who I, I don't even, as I know you guys are workers like me. These people are in Hollywood are unbelievable. Uh, you'll get a call from them in October, and they'll say, "Listen, this is great. We're on it. Um, you know, holidays are coming up, so nothing's really going to happen. We'll call you in January." And I'm like, "What? What the hell kind of business is this? Are, are you kidding me?" Uh, <laughs> but you know, eventually we got it all worked out. So, so that became uh, Operation Undercover, uh, which is on Investigation Discovery, which is Discovery Channel's you know premiere. Uh, network and it's also on max which was hbo max now it's max and discovery plus and and so we did the we did the first episode and that was with they, they never said this on the show but that that chief of police was my old partner my first partner that i told you guys and he was up in south carolina and it, the ratings were off the charts i mean it worked out you know that's how they do it they'll film one they give you the money to film one and they they put it on and you know, they, they gauge, they have all these focus groups come in and they, they watch it, you know, and all true crime people and all that. And so, you know, if it's a big thumbs up, they give you a full season, right? If it's mediocre or, or thumbs down, that's it. You're, you're one, 
you know, you're a uh, one hit wonder. Um, luckily, the show, thanks to the producers, no thanks to me, thanks to the producers, the show came out incredible. I don't know if you guys have been able to see it, but it, it really, it came out really good. And uh, and so they've given, they gave us a full season. We start filming in April. So if there's any anybody listening right now and any cops who have a department, you, you guys have done any kind of undercover cases in the last few years that, that worked out well, re- please reach out to me. Um, you know, we'd love to feature you. Um, you know, the success of the show, and I'm hoping this is going to be a long-term thing, it's only going to be as good as, you know, the departments that are willing to work with us. Um, you know, I'm not the, it's, it's not about me. It's we're featuring great police departments doing great work. That's what it's about. That's why I love it. Um, so I got that. Uh, going on we start filming again in april and uh the other thing is um actually a big hollywood company bought my book they bought my life rights and uh they are going to make a like a netflix type series out of these storefront operations it's going to be called storefront and you know that each season will be a different storefront with different actors you know because I, I had different agents uh, and cops in and out and uh, the actor John Bernthal, um, who's the Punisher, um, who's an incredible actor, uh, you know, he, he's on board with it. And so we're, we're going through everything now to, to see, uh, you know, what, what network it's going to be on. And, and you know, we, we got a great writer named Ma- Matthew Carnahan, who, uh, he's, he, if you Google him, he's, he's done incredible stuff. He did that great show with Don Cheadle. Uh, called uh, House of House of Lies, I believe it was, and it was incredible. And uh, he's the writer for the show, so he takes my he's taking my book and he's making it into a series, you know, a tell uh, like a Netflix series. So hopefully, again, it's this has been going on for years. Nothing happens fast, man. Enough. Uh, so I got those two things going, and uh, you know, I, I guess I've. You know, I could tell you guys this, there is zero uh, work or opportunity for a retired undercover agent in the private sector. It does not trans translate over to the private sector at all, man. <laughs> it's hard enough as a former cop, you know, I think to, to get a job. But if, if you specialize in undercover work, there's no use for that in the private sector. I found that out real right. quick. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of worked out that, you know, this is all happening for me. Could not be more happy for you. Could you, couldn't happen to a more deserving person. Uh, that's fantastic news. And you know, uh, John Bernthal taking that role. I mean, I was offered it. I turned it down. That's, <laughs> that's why awesome. he grabbed it. But right. Right, yeah, I was busy that weekend. I had stuff going on. <laughs> so your first partner, the undercover thing, um, Operation Undercover, wouldn't happen to have been Keith Brownsell. No, it? no, his, his name was Randy Beach. Um, he he was an Augusta cop, so he was he was a real cop, and uh, he he uh, you know he came on ATF and yeah you know, he was in the in the narcotics unit he was doing undercover, and man he just he hit the ground running when he came on to ATF and I was I was so lucky to just to end up with him uh, at the beginning and again his techniques were were somewhat bizarre, uh, but he taught me you know he taught me really how to how to work undercover from the ground up um you know and not not this movie shit you know but the down and dirty uh undercover 101 which is where you really have to start if you're ever going to get you know to the big leagues to the jay dobbins league you got to start out 101 and bird did too you know bird started out in back alley deals and all that like you know that's that's the way to do it those are the building blocks you know to work your way up uh Again, you know, my first biker case, they threw me in and I didn't know shit about undercover biker. I knew nothing about that whole culture, but I had had several years with Randy learning how to be undercover. And, and so I was able to at least bullshit my way just because I had that, those building blocks in that base. Um, and I, I was able to succeed. And it was interesting in, in the show in Operation Undercover, they don't ever disclose that, uh, you know, Randy was ATF or he was my partner. You know, he's just the chief of police in this small city in South Carolina. Um, but it, it just worked, man. It, it worked really good. So 
again, I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for departments. I would love to have NYPD. Uh, looking for departments. Just all we want to do is highlight the great work that's being done because it is still being done out there. Uh, not as much as when we were doing it, but you know the guys are still doing what they can do, and we want to show it. So we're working on that for you. Yeah. Um, so thank you for everything, um, for your time, first of all. Secondly, for your incredible career in service. How many people are alive because of weapons that you and your team and the men and women that like you took off the streets through one way, shape, or form or another, whether it be a storefront or a search warrant or a buy and bust or whatever it was? You guys took a lot of weapons off. That's your focus. Yes, that's where the violence is. They use the weapons. It's, it's part of the job. It's part of the career of a criminal. Uh, so thank you for doing that and for risking yourself I, I, and for giving so much of yourself to a career um, and for dealing with everything you had to deal with as a result of that and for coming out on the other side of it so willing to share your story. Uh, people need to hear these stories of, of going through the kind of things you went through. Coming out of it on the other side wiser and ready to move on with the, re the next step, next phases of your life, which are outstanding, and we couldn't be more bigger supporters of. We will let all our audience know whenever something's coming out with you, we'll keep them in touch with that. Um, and we just appreciate you so much, have so much respect for you. Thank you for, for coming on today and for honoring us with your time. Hey, listen, Dan and Tom, I, I, I would love to come back, um, you know, after the first season. Um, we're going to film it all in a row from April April, May, and June. I'd, um, I'd love to come back. And I, I just, I'd like to close out and say again, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of the NYPD. And uh, like I said, anyone who could go through, you know, a 20, 30, 35 year career and come out, and I mean, it's an accomplishment in itself because it's one of those places where, you know, there's no down, there's no down days, there's no time off. I mean, it's, you're on every day. Cause it's always happening. And, uh, I, I just have such great respect for you guys and, uh, you know, God bless you. And, and I would like to say one thing, uh, there is one of my brothers, ATF agent, Carlos Baez, V A L L E S. Uh, he was, he was paralyzed a couple months ago. He was doing an undercover deal in new Orleans. He was on the third floor in the projects and, uh, he ended up you know, there was about nine guys. One of them had an AK-47 pointed at his face, so he didn't have a lot of options. He jumped off the balcony, uh, landed on his head, and severed his spine. And uh, he's in Miami right now uh, at a at a spinal center. And I, you know, I'll give you guys the information before for his. You know, I know Tunnel Tunnels the to Towers has is now working with him uh, to get him a, a smart home. Uh, but you know, if, if anyone you know, would care to, there's merchandise you can buy to help them out and stuff. I'll, I'll give you guys the information, uh, by the time this airs. And, uh, you know, I just, I love Carlos and, uh, one of the greatest agents. He's a young guy. He's, he's 40 years old and, uh, you know, he's got a tough road ahead of him. Uh, but it, it's a great cause to help a brother out, but put that out. Absolutely. We'll, we'll share that. And, uh, we will send prayers and all the best and anything we can do for him and his family, consider it done. Um, he's your brother. He's our brother. Gosh, that's just a terrible story, but it's something that could happen to any of us at any time in that, in that line of work. Um, wow. Thank you for sharing that, Lou. Thank you. So, um, uh, as we always do, Tom will take us out at this time. We will have you back, Lou. If you're willing to come back, we will have you back at any time. And we want to always make sure our audience is up to speed on what you're involved in. Um, Tom, take it away, brother. You always take us out with such a right. panache. <laughs> uh, incredible show. I mean, again, you know, we're blessed all the time. We say it endlessly after each show every week. We're blessed with the guests that we have. And to have a a back-to-back -back with, with Jay and Lou now, it's just, uh, it's awesome. It's so good. And, and we're thrilled. And like we always do, say thank you to a cop. And if this show, this episode shows that, this job is not easy. Not one part of it is easy. The physical part, the mental part that goes with it. And when you can just be out there and say thank you to a cop and pat, pat him on the back 
and give them a wave, it means everything to them. Because listen, when you do that, you don't know the day they're having. You don't know what's going on. And if something bad's going on, then they look up and see someone wave to them. It means everything in the world to them. So just continue to do that. That's our big message on this show. Say thank you to a cop. Uh, and as well as the military as well. They're always in our hearts and in our prayers because they go through the same stuff. Uh, like we do at the end, subscribe to our show on youtube.com slash at gold shields, rumble.com slash gold shields. Check the video shows out and we're on every audio channel you can imagine. Follow us and we love the support. Thank you so much for everyone that's doing that. Uh, numbers dan and i don't pay a lot of attention to it but we've been looking lately and they're just off the chart and we we don't do it it's not us it's our guests and you listening and watching so thank you so much uh for lou velozzi thank you again my partner dan murphy this is tom smith everyone out there stay safe and we will see everybody soon